me, Mary Honan, and Lear Media TV and my show, Be My Guest. Um, and today my very special guest is Maura O'Connell Foley uh, from Ken Mayer in uh, County Kerry. And she is a businesswoman and renaissance woman, really. She's just an extraordinary woman, as indeed are her, were her mother and her grandmother. And from what I've been reading about her, her whole entire family is, is, is just an extraordinary uh, group of women in particular, I would have to say. But what was written about Maura and her book, which I have to tell you is called The Wild Atlantic Kitchen. You can see in the background here, um, the kitchen uh, book, but it's just, um, I'll show it to you in a few minutes, but while it's described as follows, my Wild Atlantic Kitchen captures over 250 recipes from Maura O'Connell Foley's various businesses as well as her food related collections and stories. It includes eight chapters, breakfast starters, fish, meat, vegetables, desserts, and baking, sauce, stocks, and staples, and a dinner party section. In keeping with Maura's love of art and being a supporter of local produce since she first started cooking, there are beautiful photographs of her recipes and of local producers. Also included are Irish landscape photographs by nationally renowned photographer Norman McCluskey, paintings from internationally acclaimed Irish artist Paula Buick, a close friend of Maura's, are also incorporated in the dinner party section. And there are delightful illustrations from Christine Bowen throughout the book, which add a unique artistic component. The foreword of the book was written by Derry Clark, Irish Michelin star, chef of Le Creva restaurant in Dublin. He says, and I quote, this book is the culmination of 60 years of passion, hard work and imagination, and is a summary of Maura's life working in busy kitchens. These recipes are timeless, classic and detailed. This is a book I feel every cook should have in their kitchen, as there are so many brilliant and varied recipes. It's a book recording Maura's legacy through the many years she has been at the forefront of Irish cooking. As a fellow chef, I am proud to know her and respect her for all her achievements. And I'd like to introduce you now to Maura O'Connell Foley. Hello, Maura. Hello, Mary. How are you? Beautiful day in Ken Mayer, I'd say. Wonderful. It's really so remarkable. It's like a perfect autumnal day. Yeah. But the Colouring has just started in the trees and the sun rays coming through. It's just quite magical. Yeah, and I'm loving your painting in the background. Oh, that's by Morris Henderson. It's, it's a happy picture. It very looks happy. happy. It looks very happy. I love happy, happy paintings because they give you a bit of joy when you look at them. But he had some very sad paintings, but that, they're his happy face, that like all our. <laughs> he was in a good mood when he was painting that. Maura, <laughs> he was floating, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> this is Maura's extraordinary book. And the depth of it is just uh, equally um, uh, prolific. It really is. Not just, um, not just in the amount and the, the, the weight and the size of it, but in the stories in the history that she goes into, the photographs, the paintings. I think every form or every genre of art is incorporated in this book from, the, from, from painting to photography to cooking to uh, history. And as a historian and uh, an art graduate, I really found this book just almost too beautiful. Do you know, I mean, I've never seen a cookery book as beautiful as this. Maura, where did, uh, tell me about your story because I'd like to know about your grandmother in particular to start because she just, just, I was blown away by her story and the type of woman she was. Well, well she, Mary, she was a remarkable woman because what she achieved was, was remarkable in the fact that, I think I said earlier, that time, people, they crossed the Atlantic, we thought it was one trip. If they survived it, they were amazing and they continued to work for the rest of their lives in America. But she went there, worked as a maid when she was only 15. And some years later, she returned to 
Ireland and to Kenmare, where she married her first husband, who was Crowley, and had three children. And he died when the children were very young. So they were sent out to the country out to assist in Drumbahali, to the farm, the home farm. And she returned to America, which was quite extraordinary. And, and on both occasions, Maura, she went on her own. Alone, 15, absolutely. She went on her own and, when, and in later and life. She later. Yeah, she must have been in her 20s. Well that's, in her 20s. Each, uh, that's just extraordinary. Yes. And then she returned again and came back to Kenmare. It's just quite remarkable. And married a man called Hanley, who would have been my grandfather. And they had two children. So now she had five children. And there was an Uncle Packy, who was Patrick, and my mom, who was Agnes. And she ran a very successful grocery business, importing tea, sugar, well, the sugar was Irish, but the uh, sliced pan came in and the people liked buying shop jams. Some people made their own jam, but she bought all their produce from the farmers. Then she bought, the, it was like a barter. She bought their butter, their dairy, their products, all the products, cheeses and uh, poultry and, and, and vegetables or whatever they had. Yeah. And they exchanged and they got their lovely tea. And the tea arrived that time from India in these enormous chests, big chests, wooden chests, which were or used actually as clay pins that time for children in the farmhouses, <laughs> in the houses, everywhere they'd be used for the child to stand into. So it was not all they need. That's it, absolutely, and they couldn't come out. <laughs> That's it, stay there. But it was, they managed. And the other interesting thing about her was they started the first ice cream in Kenmare in the shop. Yes, I was reading that. Which was astounding. We had, a, at that time, a railway in Kenmare. And what year was that now, you might remind? Um... That would have been in the early 30s. Wow. And the sad thing was our, we lost our railway later when Andrews, decided all the railways should go. We lost our railway in Kenmare, which was a shame. But however, that's... But Maura, wasn't it extraordinary of your grandfather as well, really, in those days? You know, because your mother or your grandmother was coming to the relationship with three children. So he was, he was taking on three children who weren't biologically his own. And in that respect, that was extraordinary as well. A, a, an, an extraordinary man. It know? was. There must have been compassion there, great compassion and understanding. You know, you either have it or you don't, but obviously that man had it. He didn't, and great love. He didn't hold it against her. He accepted her as she was. And uh, Some people would call it baggage, but he possibly looked to them as being wonderful. Uh, he, loved the, he loved her. their mother and he loved them. That's and wonderful. That's a lovely story. That. Yes, and they were all great friends right down through the li their lives. The family, the, the Handleys and, had, and Crowleys maintained close, close friendship. You know, there were, in fact, Michael would have, Dogsy, he was the eldest of the Crowleys. He would have stayed with us for many years in, in, in Kenmare. Okay. Because his wife lived out the country and he wanted to come back into town. And he stayed in our household for many, many years. And he was known as Dugsy, he was a character. And my Aunt Kathleen then was a fabulous woman. She started a little hotel in Kenmare called the Wander Inn. So they, and my mom started a tea shop when we returned from London. We, came, we went to London, my mom went over during the war. I was yeah. born there. And she returned in 1950 in the holy year. And she opened a little tea shop and cake shop, homemade cake shop, which was quite daft, really, at the time, because nobody would go and <laughs> go for tea or coffee. Yeah, or it's, safe, like it's safe to say that was <laughs> people didn't have the, the money to go. But I was... You know, there was no disposable income, really. Yeah, there was no disposable income. No, no disposable income. I was looking income. at the prices that you were charging for, for buns and cakes. Uh, and, I thought, and that was... 60s, that was 61. That was a 61, two pence for a cake, sandwiches, yeah. three pence, cream yeah. cakes, three pence, tea and coffee, two pence. Yes. Wow. <laughs> and there were the old pennies. 
Oh, I was actually, you must remember, I was, yeah, 12 pence in one shilling, 20 shillings in one pound. You can be multiplying that out. <laughs> he, made, he made 70 euros um, in, in um, the big fair First, at Ken Mayer in 19... It's like Pop Fair. It's the 15th of August. It's the big run day. It's a big meeting day for everybody. And this year, sadly, this is the first year that it was very sad with COVID. It yeah. It didn't really happen. But that every other year in my lifetime, it's been the biggest day of the year in Canberra. Have you found COVID has affected it badly? I ask you that because I was listening to Lord Alan Sugar uh, during the week on, Scott, um, on with Philip and Holly. And he, yeah. they were opening the girl that won um, the apprentice in... <clears throat> Uh, yes. last year she's just opened her second tea room in London and he said that that was the best time for restaurants because anywhere where there's food people need food and people will always go to a, a food place so that they can just get out of the house get a break or meet somebody if, if, if only just to sit down for an hour or two or a half an hour or whatever. Do you know, do you yeah. think that it's been it's what people, Yes. It's actually what people crave most. In, when, if you're in, but during lockdown, we weren't even able to do that, you see. That's the yeah. tragedy. In that lockdown period, that was really like Christmas Day every day. You know, the play, everything was deserted. There wasn't any business Christmas at all. Christmas Day without the fun. Yeah, the only places that stayed open were the pharmacies and e even the ordinary food outlets. Uh, it was takeaway, you see, because there was such strict, uh, in, in the beginning, uh, you had to comply with such strict distancing that it, it, would, it didn't work initially. So, but now things are back more to normal with the spacing and everything like that. But it's sad now for the pubs that cannot that don't do food you know we're going to have an enormous change in lifestyle mm. it, it, it's incredible it, it's going to be such a different world it's very it's hard to visualize but i'm very pro i'm very I, I suppose i'm a glass half full person and i i feel that once people i think irish people anyway will be are very resilient we're a resilient oh. people. I think we're eternal we're eternal we're, optimists it, and uh, we're eternal optimists we live in we are we're marvelous and i think it's, once people get any whiff at all of we're grand now we're grand we'll uh, you know well, we, everything will be back to normal we'll forget completely that we we went through this hell <laughs> But your mother um, was also, the, she took, and she seems to have bought and just seems to have been relentless at buying and, and, and adding on and, and to, to the business and taking chances. And she was. She was quite amazing because she didn't have a lot of money because we had a garage at one time. And then, unfortunately, there was an incident in that where we lost a lot of capital, the working capital of the business was actually lost to cars being bought Old by... Volkswagen Beetle, your dad sold. Yes, oh my yeah, God, they nice. sold his mouth like hotcakes, you know. people. I just want a Volkswagen Beetle. It's all I've ever <laughs> wanted. A yellow Volkswagen, Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> I like Mr. Banana. <laughs> yeah. Like <a> Banana. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was uh, a special little car, really, and... People loved them because they were air-cooled and everything like that. They were so suitable for the country. They didn't heat up, you know, if we were going up a hill, they were amazing cars. And we sold a lot of those, but we lost the working capital. We were doing with a dealer in Dublin and he used to work at post data checks, so we got stock. So it meant the working capital of the garage made, you know, it, it, it lost its momentum. And that was in 1960. And that's the time in 61, Agnes decided, look, we'll have to do something. Either I was going back to London or we'd do something. And she did. She rented a little property and I operated it and worked with it. She just supervised it. And, and by Agnes, you mean your mother? Called it Purple Heather and it went from there. And Corny, my sister, still operates a Purple Heather today. And that, hence the photograph, the Purple Heather. Exactly. That's why it's in the book. It was... Uh, pub, uh, there was a license attached to it because, but we initially we didn't use the license at all because of personal reasons we didn't. And 
then she thought about it. That time pubs were sort of a no-go area for women. Do you know, they, they weren't the, it isn't like the 20th century where people live in pubs, well, before COVID. Yeah. The pub was the social centre of the world, really, of Ireland. Singing pubs and music and everything, which was so... And down in Kenmare, it would have probably been like John B. Keane's list of... Oh, where you Kenmare was amazing. Just didn't allow women in. Kenmare was marvellous because we have an, an abundance of musicians. Oh, yeah. And sure, music is food and music. They're the joys of life. And you can survive anything as long as you have music, food, and faith. And exactly. I don't mean faith oh. in, in a religious oh. sense, but faith that things are going to get better. Exactly. Oh. So that's where, yeah, that's where things have been good. But generally, I think country people and especially country people have this amazing capacity. They're close to nature. That they can see the changing seasons. They can see change all the time. They accept it and it's part of your life. So I think that's why we've been so good at accepting uh, all the different phases of COVID. Yes. There are a lot. Yes. And people are generally, generally marvellous, very good. And there'll always be those that sort of, people have different beliefs. Some people possibly don't believe that it's there. I don't know. But what did happen during this period, we missed out on our launches. There was a launch to be in Dublin. There was a launch in Dublin and to be held in the oldest bookshop in London, in Melbourne. Yeah, yeah, and they didn't happen, but one way or another, radio was good. People were good to us. We got a lot of press and people bought the book. And one of the first places it was for sale was Mahoney's in Limerick. They were marvelous. Yeah. And it, they loved it and they have been doing more cooking now. I think you'll find that. The, the, the supermarkets and food outlets have had a bonanza with people buying food. And a lot of people who never cooked before have been cooking. So People have been forced into the kitchen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm an only child. I had a mother who never wanted you anywhere near her kitchen because... <laughs> By your very presence, you would you would mess up, up her kitchen, and she that was her domain, and uh, I've never. But you know, I appreciate the fact that you have, um, in this book, you have lots of of uh, vegetarian food because I've gone pescatarian in the last two years. I'm trying to ease myself into full vegetarian. I'm finding it difficult to avoid fish because I love fish, but I don't eat any meat or chicken um, or, you know, and, and I find it very difficult to make gravies without there being meat inside in them. And I know your daughters are vegetarians. So how do you cope with well, if you, a vegetarian you, to make a gravy? Well, if you want to make a gravy, sweat shallots, you know, shallots, sh shallot, yeah. because they're sweeter and do it in butter, gently. And tomato, you know, if you, get, if you want to get a rich, rich brown, if you roast tomatoes, or even if you fry them in the pan, you get this amazing mahogany color. Uh, that's where even, in, even when you're doing a meat stock, sometimes the brown coloring comes from roasting the tomatoes. Okay. So that's an enormous help, sweat. And if you season with a tiny bit of um, smoked paprika, it gives that bacon flavor. You know, okay. for vegetarians, the thing they possibly crave most sometimes is the flavor of smoked. You can smell something that's smoked and cooking, and it's a great aroma. Yeah. But the, smoke... the, the one thing I miss um, is gravy. My mum used to make these beautiful um, mince burgers and <laughs> with lots of onions and and mince and she'd roll it in flour and then she'd <gasps> put gravy over it with lots of onions inside and the gravy as well and potatoes yeah. and i miss i miss well, the, uh, gravy if you do if you use the shallots a lot and, and and um definitely you can produce a wonderful and, and a few tomatoes you would be get yourself a very good and seasoning of course Easy. you'll get a very good flavored um, type gravy. I saw in your book that you you were saying that it's important. It's not important to 
measure anything when it comes to cooking, but is when it comes to baking. Um, and that you that that the the, the um, important thing is to taste. Oh, definitely. Well, baking is a science, more. Yeah. You see, if you're making uh, if you're making a soup or doing anything, uh, cooking um, some vegetables, it, it's not as scientific as baking. The quantity that you use in baking is of the utmost importance. Yeah. To get the ratio right. You know, you have raising agents, you have shortening agents, you have your butter, you have season, you have your salt. You must um, keep it, keep the balance right. Yeah. Whereas with cooking, it's up to your own taste. You know, if you're doing a casserole, in fact, the more onions you put into it, the more shallots you put in it, the sweeter it will be. Yeah. You don't, you know, they're the sweeteners. Uh, and uh, it's fascinating what you can do with to enhance the flavor with that. And just the seasoning is of the utmost importance. People overlook that. I mean, don't ever cook your vegetables without salt, except for pulses. If you do your beans or anything with salt, they, they just stay hard forever. So don't put your salt in there. But oh, that's generally, interesting to know. That's probably, that probably explains why my beans don't turn out. Uh, <laughs> on the rare occasions I cook, but I am going to now that I found something that you can actually get vegetarian food in. It's just, um, uh, or or at least semi-vegetarian. But um, what was I going to say to you, Maura? Your mother opened the restaurants and she opened the um, the Purple Heather, but she extended it and moved. You moved. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. Always in the or, you see, we only rented a little premises initially in 61. Yes. And then two years later, she bought a, a semi derelict most beautiful property in Canmare. There's a, a row of houses that were built at the same time as the church. They're done with sandstone and cut stone. And they're quite delightful. There's about four, about five houses in the middle of Henry Street. And she valued the, the um, she treasured the frontage and preserved it, which was wonderful because one of the frontages was removed by somebody, but it's since been replaced. So it, she did appreciate a beautiful building yeah. and we only restored it bit by bit. It was semi, it was only part of it usable when we bought it, but that's how she worked and did it. And she appreciated the character of it at high ceilings, lovely staircase and just a simple little townhouse, but lovely. And that's where the Purple Heather then moved and is still there. But what you did have there was the first pub, then initially, a later, not initially, not when she started first, where women were allowed in, came in. We had a piano bar, which was, oh my gosh, that would have been in from the that 60s. Was in a, that was in Innovative right as well. It was crazy. It was like a club every night. Piano was playing and people were singing. And the one thing she never allowed, two groups of singers. You had to, if you started opposition, you were put out. <laughs> that was the only reason. It was you know, very put, loyal. Yeah, it worked very well. You know, we're happy. There were very happy memories. And all, there were hotels that time. You had Park Nassila and the Great Southern in Canmere, they employed a lot of people, a lot of young people. They would have been the main employers. And of course, they were all from other towns and they were so, Purple Heather was the meeting place for them. Did they just yeah. loved, yeah, yeah. You know, they'd hitch a ride and whatever way they had to come. In fact, the people in Park Nassila used to order extra bread. A lot of the young people down there, there was, oh my God. Terry McCoy and Aiden. Aiden was one of them. Aiden, Aiden White. White. Yes. No, Aiden White. <laughs> they would ring Mike Scott and say, we want so many dozen loaves of bread. He'd deliver it. They didn't want it at all. But they'd, and then they'd get a drive up to Kenmare <laughs> to go to Perm Come in and spend the, their evening off Isn't there. Aiden right? fabulous. Yeah. They were happy times, you know, yeah. even though people didn't have, you know, there was no thing as an abundance of money. Yeah. Not today. But they managed so well, and as long as people had just a little to spend, but they knew how to enjoy themselves. But your mother, your, your mother and your grandmother knew what to, they weren't just, as from what I've read, they weren't just um, people who were into cooking. 
um, they were they were innovative. They 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 were creative. They were business women. They were entrepreneurs. Um, in in times when people barely had a vote, if they even had a vote a, 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 a during a, a, when your grandmother was was uh, fifteen years of age, and and to actually have the tenacity to get onto a boat, go to America make a, a life, come back and, yeah. and, and rear two families and yeah. also start a, a business which is, has, is still there to this day and starts at, and from that several businesses have, uh, have, have come out of it. How many businesses are owned by, um, by your family now in Kenmare today as a result of that one woman? Oh, let me see. No, no, well, my aunt would have, they have a couple of properties. Um, so a lot of them were in the food business for years and then later they sold the wandering. They sold, which was a terrific place. And my cousin is in, has his butcher shop, still have, and supplies marvellous meat, the best you can get. And then... We ourselves, we have the Purple Heather, we have, my son has opened a pizzeria, a small little place, but now it's only takeaway. And where Pac is, where my uncle's shop was, they're now trading as a place called a niche. And just for technical reasons, we still have the name Pac, he says my uncle and will always have it. And then the Shelburne Lodge, where I'm operating from now, is an old Georgian house that we restored. It took five years to restore it. Um, you know, that is that is extraordinary because you don't uh, often hear of say families one after another going into the same or similar business and keeping it going and keeping that you know here in Limerick we have a restaurant and I always think about it um, the Jasmine Palace restaurant it's a Chinese restaurant and it's always managed to keep up the standards uh, from the first day that it opened to present day, there's always that that standard of of, of cleanliness and standard of of food that they've never dropped. And I think that that's extraordinary when you can do that. It is. It's wonderful. I I suppose the Chinese, the Indians are like that definitely. Uh, well, the Chinese would have it. But you see, it's to do. Uh, in the old days, I think people had a sense of continuity. Yeah. Even with family names, they did it. Whereas now in this modern world, it's not there to the same extent. And one believed in loyalty and supporting this, you know, all this type of situation. That's the way we were. And uh, things have changed a little now. I think there's more of emphasis, I suppose, with the technological development, things have changed a little. And there's absolutely no doubt, though I'm a believer that in any town in Ireland, if you started a little small town, if you start a good food outlet, whatever it is, if it's only some lovely produce to sell and take away, or it's a little small restaurant, a little cafe, it enhances more than any other business the whole area. Oh, you're and so it, right. It becomes so a destination. Right. You see, yeah. people love it destination no in, in Limerick now everybody went to out to the Dirty Nellies can you yeah. imagine that's the first singing pub I suppose in Ireland really outside of maybe in well Dublin, we did there. because we were in Bonratty Aidan was the manager in Bonratty Aidan White you lived and there <laughs> I was an ent entertainer there and you'd always end up either in the Shannon Shamrock or Dirty Nellies because it was the of only course. place was music they, they were famous and the same, I suppose, with the man down in Kinsale. There was a tremendous man down there. He started the Wild Geese Festival. And oh, yes, yes, yes. Loons me now. But it, it shows you, they, you see, people want happiness. They want to relax. They want um, to just leave behind their, everybody has commitments and chores and whatever they have to do. And life tosses in everybody's plate. There is something to be coped with. And even so when, the, when the severe lockdown ended, people went straight for restaurants, straight for cafes, straight for tea rooms. Absolutely, totally. It was just a way of, it's, it's, there's an enjoyment in eating. 
not a lot of food or anything like that, but in having a little sip of something, a little sip of wine or a little good coffee, they're all coffee buffs now. But it's also spiritual, Maura, because I, mean, I was teaching, um, I suppose, world religions for a while at Mary Immaculate. And it's amazing how many religions and religious beliefs are built around and, and faith, uh, faith built uh, uh, organizations built around food and about eating and breaking bread. Well, it's the sharing. It's like the Last Supper. Yeah, yeah. You see, it's the whole emphasis of sitting and sharing and eating. Yeah. And it, it definitely, it's, it's special. It is, you see, it's, that's why it's so sad when people don't sit around the table now. But I so, think COVID made forced people around the table more. Again, which again, is good. For a while, which Absolutely. Was good. Because were... young, some of the younger, my grandchildren, they, you know, did, they'd be quite happy with their iPad and their yeah, yeah. gizmo and whatever, and their food beside them. So we always ban food and gizmos. You know, you're not allowed. Gizmos. Which, <laughs> <laughs> that's probably a carry word. I don't know what it is. But <laughs> <laughs> my mother used to say a gizmo. Gizmos. <laughs> But Maura, you went to London in the 60s to your aunt, who was a nurse, a, a, a nun. And how instrumental was convent education? Because I, I went to uh, the Sisters of Mercy. They didn't teach me cooking, but how instrumental were they in, in, in developing your, your um, love or uh, your passion for? Well, they were good. They, they wouldn't have influenced my cooking. What influenced the cooking was the fact that I was, I wasn't a deboarder. I was, a, I was staying with my aunt who worked in the foreign office, worked in Whitehall mm. and war office. Doing but you see, I met her in town. I'd meet her at weekends in town and she worked strange times. She wasn't a sort of nine to five woman. She, she, she had a sort of very, interesting job and she wouldn't leave until about 11 o'clock but she didn't come home until late at night but I would meet her and we'd go to the Berwick Street Market in Soho so that's where I developed a big interest and then she would take me to all these little restaurants I was so lucky that I, in Ireland at home we wouldn't be doing that it wouldn't have been no. not at all you so she, those restaurants in, that you mentioned. She knew in Dean Street all the Italians. She knew all the different areas. It's all ethnic. So it was totally ethnic. It's interesting. I know it became sleazy at one stage, then it became something, but it retained that the Greeks are in one area, the Chinese are in another, Italians are in, and the Fritz Street, then you had the French. And, you know, it was amazing how ethnic it was. And you had the different regional cooking, but she knew a lot of the families there. There were all families that came, and especially the Italians. We used to go to a little trattoria there, and it was just astounding. I think I'd mentioned it in the book, even the yeah, way they worked they and Swiss. their whole culture. And they're like the Irish families. They brought other members of the family. They'd come out from Italy they'd, to London, and they would enter the business, and it would develop and progress from there. I mean, they controlled a lot of the places in Soho. And it's fascinating in that way. And they didn't, they didn't digress from their own food. They stayed with it. They realized the wonder of their produce. And, and, and they stayed with what they liked. Like and knowing they, your market when you're selling something or when you're writing a book, knowing your market. Well, appreciating quality. They always, the Italians are great. The French are marvelous. Greeks, they all, they're all proud. And the Irish. Perhaps we didn't have as big a, a food culture as these countries. So the Indians that had their amazing spices, but I suppose our cooking would have been, at least it was the best of produce, which we still have today, but we have wonderful fish. We have wonderful farm grass fed animals. I know a lot of people are against it now and they want us not to have any cows or animals out and beetles at all. But the these are when you have produce like that, the Irish therefore didn't have to do too much. We just had our own gardens though, they'd have onions growing, they'd have pine. And so we seasoned our food very simply. 
but those uh, I got a great love of food from going to those places and meeting those people and talking to them. And you could find their, you know, passion and their excitement. Mm -hmm. And there were two Swiss ladies who were refugees, Maison and that was fine Swiss. food. Maison Swiss. Maison Suisse. They were just so astounding. Two sisters, and they were refugees. They had come during the war and they had a little place in the part of Soho that's demolished now, which was the other side of town where probably the post office tower was or whatever. But they're the most amazing restaurant. And that was the first time I ever saw Hollandaise. Hollandaise. My aunt went there because they did some sort of a chicken dish that she had always suffered from a tummy probably something that she was able to she loved and digested and but that was an exciting time Maura to be in London during the, the it, 60s it was and then of course you had King's Road that time was just it's still I mean King's Road now is still kind but of it really also weird. informed uh, your, it, it also informed your flair for fashion or your flair oh, for, for colour and for absolutely. pattern and for wonderful you see it was a magic city. I still love, I love London even today. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, was I born can't there. imagine life without going to London in the year. So I've been there in March now. I'm just hoping that if there's, if COVID settles, I'll be able to get there before the end of this year, because there's a little bit of my heart there, just a yeah. small bit. This is here in Kerry. I just, I love, I love Kerry. I love all the West Coast, the magic of it. I mean, the coast in Ireland is just so special. It's exciting. But you have the best of both worlds, you see, with London and with Kenmare, because you have the wilds of Kenmare, the naturalness of it, the, um, the, 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 the uh, uh, and then you have the, the vibrancy and the, the bustle, and the, the hustle and bustle of London. Do you know there are two? Yes. Well, well, Khmer is like a little miniature, you know, it, it's really a fascinating place. Their people are interested in, they're interested in art, they're interested in music, they're interested in food. They're always a little bit, we think they're great because they're, um, they're, they're not interested in vast, commercial, big. They, they like to have it individual. There's a lot of individual shops, a lot of people with flair, and the place is... It's quite special in its own way. It's a plant town, which isn't the norm in all the towns in Ireland. A lot of them are not planned. Therefore, it's it's beautifully laid out and with a, with a lovely square. And it has a lot of history. Whether the history is good or otherwise is... That's history is history. And history is history. You know. and, and life was the way it is. And now we have people, even the book now, getting back to the book. The, um, there's a graphic design studio, I mean, imagine that, set up in Kenmare, a boy who was in, he's from Kenmare, went and did his graphic design in Dublin, went to London for experience, and now has set up in Kenmare as, at the Anchor Studios. And so that enabled us to do the book. And there's a, there was a girl working with him as well, Natalie Moriarty, who she did all the scripting and, and in, in the book as well which was, it, it helped the presentation, but they were artistic, then you would be wanted. And there was great discussion on the book in as much that we wanted a moody. We didn't want very colorful. Um, they understood what we wanted and were so delighted. He made I it think I'm trying What I'm trying to show from the photographs is a little sample of, and I'll, I'll intersperse some of uh, the, the photographs um, when I'm editing the show. But, you know, to give people a sense of what the book is about, I particularly love the centre one here. I don't know what it is uh, about it. It's, um, it's the, the, the hands holding, digging out um, the, the vegetables out. Of, it, look, it appears out of the ground. It just feels so earthy. And so it, it, it's, it's just the colours and everything about it. It's just a fabulous book. I mean, everything about it is just is 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 just extraordinary. Um, how important do you think you were talking earlier about the bartering system that you used? Uh, I've long believed that bartering is wonderful. I mean, you look after the you, you buy from local uh, producers, 
you um, you in, uh, local people got involved in the creating of this book. Friends of yours, people you knew, did all the artwork. It was very collaborative, um, and the photography. Um, do you think that um, that we don't look after our own enough when it comes? We buy in too much. Do you think that um, that we could buy locally more? Well, what I have noticed is, you know, when the super, those big supermarkets opened in Kenmare first, they, they didn't really support local. Yeah. But now they do. In, in, in the stores in Kenmare, say the organic gardener, now there's an organic section. Yeah. You see? And they buy from Billy, Billy, who was the first organic. You see, well, in the old days, everybody was organic. Yeah. In your, your, my youth, we just grew veg. People grew vegetables. Of course, they were organic. There was before there was any fertilizers and chemicals or anything being used on the land. So therefore, everything was organic. But then in the eighties, when Billy started, you had, you had chemicals being used that time, and he started the first organic farm here in Kenmare, and he's still doing it. And his son is doing it with him now, even though. They were all graduates and everything like that, but they just left all that academia behind them. And they love being close to nature and producing these wonderful um, vegetables and fruit. And what ha it's so exciting down there. I mean, there's photographs from his place in the book. And the yeah. work they do, they don't look at it as work. It, it, obviously, it's a source of um, joy and happiness for them. And it isn't for the money because they don't get a lot of money for their produce. But to be fair, the three so big, vast supermarkets here, they're all supporting local now. And if you notice the German places, there's Irish. They realize that the Irish want to buy Irish. Yeah. And they really do. They're very, they are loyal to Irish suppliers and in some people then to local as well. You know? That's very important. Do you know what I love, uh, Maura, is the, is, is the introduction of the recipes in, the bo in your book that are all handwritten. Because oh. when I, I interviewed, as I say, I did my PhD on, the, on childhood under Nazism, and I have some handwritten letters from one particular survivor. And to me, there's nothing will replace the, the actual fact that I actually have letters from her and envelopes with her writing on it and special notes to me. And I think it's important up here on, on, on the photograph, you can see your handwriting, um, writing out the recipes. What made you decide, um, why did you decide to write the book? I know it was a process over a period of time with people asking you to do it. Yes. Did you decide well, I suppose... finally that's it? And did you keep a record of all um, uh, you, because you have, you know, it's remarkably detailed, your book. But what I would have had, Mary, is I would have had the recipes. Oh, you would laugh now if you saw them. I'd have inside boxes. And, but I've had a file of the recipes I was asked for most, you see. So that I've had access to somebody stayed or whether in the restaurant or wherever they were. You'd give them the recipe if they wanted it. You know, you'd have it printed out and there for them. So I suppose... The finding, the, the problem with putting those recipes together was I was a big person with a tablespoon, a bit like the Italians, you know, or I mean, people, Irish people, when they made their bread long ago, nobody ever weighed their bread. Like, That's what know. I was going to talk, that, say to you earlier, you said about the importance I'd of weight. What important. about our grandparents who weighed nothing? They, but they had the feel. They had the they, feel. My grandmother was Welsh and she used to but, just throw in... By measurements. They had the feel, they knew their fist would tell you that would be so many ounces. You know, they knew how many they wanted. They would do it on a constant basis. Put in so much, they knew the amount of flour they wanted and they probably use a teaspoon for their bread soda or whatever and make sure it wasn't all lumpy or whatever raising agent they used. They did it by instinct. And the big thing with bread making is, especially the soda bread, if it's over mixed, you can't eat it, it's as tough as bell metal. So it was by hand. That was, be, you know, they, they did everything by hand. They'd even make it up on the table there and push it all together the way that the French made their pastry. They wouldn't even use a bowl. 
they, they'd put the flour on the table and then they'd put their shortening into it and they'd know by the consistency how much milk they should put in and until they have the, they have the right consistency. And when you use your hand, you always know the consistency that's correct. Yeah. It's, it's a reflex action with them. They, they just know it. It's instinctive. And it's over time, it's developed. It's like the skill, if you watch people working with yeast dough, but that, yeah. the more you handle that, the, the lighter it becomes. It's different from the sort bread. Yeah. And it's such a skill to see the way they work with that dough. But it's, again, their hands and constant repetition and feeling. And you get this amazing bread at the it's end. It's amazing that you have a Hobart mixer here. <laughs> and you have it since 1962. Yeah, it we must have been made by crops or somebody like no, that. No, no, I know. No. I'm just saying because my mum had one of these. Um, her my best friend since we were four. Her her first job was in crops, and she bought my mother a mix one of these um, uh, a, a, an electric carving knife in 1977. 1970s and the carving knife tip wood wherever I can find wood is still going strong but but crops is long closed because they made things that never broke and, oh. <laughs> and you're still and now everything's so disposable but you still oh. use the they didn't, they didn't have the built-in as we call it the built-in obsolescence yeah everything, yeah, yeah everything now has a built-in obsolescence, obsolescence. Yeah, absolutely it only meant that, meant that a few years back, so I'll get rid of it. No. Well, the Hobart was amazing. They were, it's still going, imagine, in the purple heather that yeah, yeah. corn is using it. And but it's it's, probably uh, never well, you couldn't out, Maura. It, it's just magic the way it has worked away. You have to keep it greased, look after the inside of it, all right, with that sort. But it's, um, again, the use of the mixer for making bread very difficult because sometimes the girls they wouldn't you know if you you've got to be so accurate the accuracy comes in there you're not able to feel it so if you put on that mixture and let it mix in the moisture to it you could have your bread inedible you know you get it all holes and just not right because can i just say that in 1961 i can just imagine the rest of the 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 purple heather with all the beautiful. Now I'm not really, I love, I, I used to love baking. I'm not really into sweet food, sweet things. Right. I love colors and I love how pretty they look. And I, I would just sit there and look at how beautiful they look. But like you sold Genoese sponges, Madeira cakes, layer cakes of all flavors, eclairs, tarts, meringues, shoe pastries, puff pastry made with butter and a, an abundance of biscuits. My God, I mean, people must have been just queuing up. Well, you see, the interesting thing is, I'll tell you something very interesting. At that time, that's, that's the time that, sorry about that. No, you're that's, okay. that's the time that you just said to me there, no, I've lost the thread of that. Sorry. All the, all the bake, all the lovely cakes and that, that you saw yes. in 1961. Well, I can remember, you, you know what just came in? That was the beginning, that era was the beginning of a high ratio, the, the a slightly sign, um, processing coming into food. The 60s saw the beginning of processed food. And it arrived first with um, gatto cakes. And you had the branding and the packaging. Now, we made simple homemade cakes and they were beautifully iced and, and decorated and everything. And they were lovely. And they were homemade. But I lived in Africa and Tom was there for eight years. I only lived there for a short time when I married just for a few months. And I was there a couple of times. But what do you notice in Africa? They revere anything American. And they something they have themselves, they have the same appreciation for it. So therefore, homemade cakes in 1961 weren't regarded as um, the ultimate. They were homemade. And 
when you got the box of Gatto cakes, it was made with high ratio of flour, hydrogenated oil, I don't know what kind of eggs, but they had a program every day. They sponsored on Radio Air and the program Gatto. And they sold a lot of cakes. And some people would actually have thought in their naivety that those cakes were better than a homemade cake. Yeah. Could just give you the, the contrast now, the way things have gone full circle. But no. do you think, do you think um, we've lost, well, do you think we've lost out in a lot because of all this processing that's gone into food now? I mean, when I was a child, uh, I came from England and but and I never really at the time liked bacon and cabbage or anything like that. But when you think back on the vegetables and carrots and things like that, that you were forced to eat because I, I love vegetables now, they tasted so much different than... They do now, uh, certainly the processed uh, um, fruit and the processed vegetables, unless you get organic. When you're eating organic, it, it, it's as close to what it was when I was growing up. But just kind of feel that. And you all you also hear lots of people saying, oh, the vegetables don't taste the same as they used to before um, when we were growing up. Do you, do you think there's any um, truth in that? Well, it depends on whether you're going for the, you see, if you're trying to, there are producers trying to produce very inexpensive mass produced vegetables. And so there are probably, there's a, probably a lot of chemicals used in the process, yeah. perhaps but not visible. You see, that's what I say. The chemical isn't visible. And if you have a little snail on your piece of lettuce or something, people go, Ooh. <laughs> poor little snail. Ooh, uh, and, and raise, they sit up and they got it in a restaurant for them. I mean, they'd, they'd right. have to get a refund or they'd, whatever, they'd have to nearly be paid to. to well, it would be up on Facebook or Twitter within two seconds. There'd well, you see, what they realize is, of course, it's not properly washed, That's, which is, would be very naughty. But they don't realize that, as far as I'm concerned, um, it's far less invasive than a chemically grown leaf that's grown overnight you know you can grow leaves overnight with the, with the use of um, forced chemicals and all that so people don't see that they just see the end product and it's the same i suppose with the gmos with genetically modified but i'm not going into that because i remember coming in i came home from the slow food movement in turin and I was completely taken with um, the slow food movement and save our seeds and all that. And I had a very dear friend who lectured in uh, genetics in one of the universities. And I was talking to him about it. And he said, Maura, if you have an hour now, I'll sit you down there, he said. And he said, without genetically modified food, a lot of the world would be starving. So you, you, there's two sides to a lot of things but the big problem with it then is anything that's genetically modified doesn't produce seeds that will grow the next year you're forced to buy again it's like a built-in obsolescence thing yeah you you cannot you, they don't reproduce you have to um go out and buy new seeds so there's a whole minefield out there and you, really, you really did create, I mean, the more I keep looking at the book, the more I see that you did really create a moodiness in, your, in, in the book, um, both in the, in the food and in the, in the colours. I mean, look at that, that, that photograph behind me, the purple heather and the orange mountain, the, 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 the light on the mountain. Oh, absolutely beautiful. And, yes. And I mean, that, that, that room there that you have, for your breakfast, um, for your breakfast photographs. Um, that, that's, that's the building you're in right now, isn't it? Yes, I'm in that room now. Mm. That's fabulous. Yes, but yeah, I like, um, you see, young architects, they love white, but I, I like um, warm yeah. colors and a lot of people don't like them. You know, I like yellows and orange. The yellow and that you have behind, is it summer sun? 
Yeah, this was all done by girl. The walls were all done by Wendy Hayes. She was another girl who was an interior lady. She's married to an, um, in Canmare now. And she's, her mom, I would have known her mom very well, Mary Raw. But she did all that labor intensive. They were powders done with two brushes. It took her six months to do those walls. But they're really? Easy. Yeah. It's not a wallpaper or it's not um, uh, done with uh, just a sponge. No, some it's sponge, it's, it's, you know, sponge. It's, 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 it's done with a brush. She puts on uh, one layer right. first. The paper of love. Yeah. Absolutely. She was Wendy, Wendy Hayes. She's now Wendy Dignam, I think, but her married name. She married an architect. And I just love warm colours. Uh, I feel we have a grey, grey days. Today is wonderful. But generally, we don't see a lot of glowing, warm conditions. Yeah, warm uh, colours put you in a warm mood. You don't have, uh, you know, it's grey. Generally, when you look out, it's grey. But it is in Ireland anyway. Absolutely. So that's why I like them. But they're, they're difficult for some people. Some people don't like them. But what, but, would you, um, uh, what would you hope that people would get from your, from your beautiful book as if just looking at it wasn't enough? I mean, you could easily leave this on your coffee table. And as we were saying earlier, take a uh, photocopy everything from it and use uh, work on, your, uh, on the photocopies. But because it's um, it, it's just an extra. It's it's a book that you would give as a as a gift to somebody, happily. That was into. I know my best uh, my friend Carmel. She is really into cooking, and I know this would be a book that she would just absolutely cherish. And you know, it's. I know what I'm going to get her for Christmas. Do you know? But yes. It, but you I hope see she's not watching this, <laughs> or she'll know before. Hi. I would say the book is timeless. It's not a flash in the pan and go and say, oh, we, well, we saw that, we don't want that. It's, it's way more extensive it than is. just that uh, book, book just covering. It's, it covers so many periods. And if you're a very simple, if you're just cooking for the first time, you can do it with that book because they're very simple recipes. And if you want to get onto complex recipes, they're there because I followed Michel Girard. I followed a lot of the classical chefs and Nico and, oh my goodness, so many of them. And Pierre Kaufman, all those people, they were just astounding You chefs. trained under some of them, didn't you, in London? I didn't have the advantage of working with any of the molecular people now, you know, yeah. because each, people like Blumenthal and there are so many of them. What do you think of this proliferation of, 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 of chefs now that are, are on TV and that? Do you, uh, uh, well, you I think it's wonderful. Mean, and why did you go in that area? I think it's wonderful. I think yeah. it really, they're, it's great. They're, they're making, they're not making food complicated. No. They're letting you understand, look, you can get a simple gas burner. I mean, they can do it with anything. And they say you are a little electric stove or whatever you have. It, it doesn't matter. But it means that, look, it's simple. You can cook simply and you really don't have to go crazy um, with ingredients or whatever you want. But the, the essence of it all is they can make, they can have some interesting combinations. But quite honestly, with the Indians and the Chinese, and the Italians, there's nothing new under the sun, really. And you've got to remember, there's a lot of fuss today about chili and spices and everything. But we had spice ships. The spice ships went along the Adriatic, do you see? In the old days, spices were used to make food exciting. And you take things like even the old sauces that they'd sort of turn up their nose at now, the brown sauce and the... Um, the in, in the old days, a lot of young people today think, oh God, their food was so boring. You know, they didn't use anything interesting. Whereas food was interesting. We had the spice ships. That's what I wanted to tell you, say to you. And they went right through from India to the, up the Adriatic to deliver the spices and the silks, the silk road. So food was interesting. And in, the Indians 
Tom, my husband, was at a, a banquet, a 40 course vegetarian banquet for a wedding. Can you just imagine? I mean, what they do with vegetarian food is just mind blowing. You can't even get a vegetarian dinner half the time in, 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 in where I, near where I live. I, I get miserable when I'm out. Well, <laughs> you see, with fish and chips. It, it's interesting. It's just that different countries have a respect for vegetables. Now, the French would, you know, you wouldn't be cared for very well if you were French. You know, you might get a few souffles or something. But generally speaking, they don't like uh, vegetarians. You know? <laughs> I know. I go every year to France <laughs> lecturing and you can never get anything uh, vegetarian. No, they, they, that's not a... <laughs> I end up with fish and mashed potato. <laughs> So that, that varies from country to country, but it's quite fascinating today, the, you know, that there was there, that the Indians were able to do that, and Thai food as well. They do amazing things with vegetables. Fabulous food. Yeah. And the Chinese, I suppose, with their stir fries, which everybody's doing now. And um, I think our pretty that we had, we boiled things a little bit too much. That's why you probably didn't like your vegetables when you were young, because everything was overcooked and oh, no. boiled too much. Uh, yeah, she boiled every, she Yeah, she, she liked everything. Um, even the steak, when she was getting steak, it was nearly cremated. Do you know? Oh, and uh, um, and <laughs> she was just not ashamed to say it either. Could you take that back, please? I need it more, uh, dark, uh, cr practically cremated. It was just desperate. No, she was a lovely cook, beautiful cook. It's just... I didn't like bacon and cabbage, and but now mm. I'd sit down and eat just a plate of veg. I love veg. My tastes have completely yeah. changed. Yes, well, that's great. But you see, the, the one thing in the old days, their bacon was totally different from what we have now. When is much well, they're back to the dry cured now. But for years, there was no dry cured available for except for very specialist people. And my mum's side of the family were all butcher clover meats in Limerick. So they were all into curing. And my uncle was the head curer in the bacon factory. He went to uh, Hungary or Budapest, somewhere like yes, that. Learned about curing. To, to teach, to talk about curing. That's but, fascinating. They were experts. Well, I just never, uh, and he only had one arm. He slipped and and um, had to have the arm amputated, but he was still able to cure bacon with one arm, uh, and he wow. continued working. And oh, fantastic. yeah, they they were all in in, in clover meats um, in Limerick, and every year she, she worked in the office there, and she used to pack the um, hams up, and they used to go to the Irish College in Rome to the priests there at every year. And I can remember my grandmother was. Uh, Welsh and they were Protestant but my mother used to send over and when I'd go to England I'd bring a ham about that size on the <laughs> plane. <laughs> You'd be waddling out um, at Shannon Airport uh, up the steps of the plane <laughs> with a big ham <laughs> because it was uh, Limerick, Limerick ham. <laughs> fantastic. Oh sure there were all pork butchers and a lot of pork butchers in, in Limerick. Yeah you wouldn't, Ryanair wouldn't allow you on with a ham now. <laughs> Oh, half, oh, half, oh, half the oh. pig was on my in my arms. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were great days. What you see, <laughs> uh, uh, that was worth bringing. Yeah, that was yeah, worth yeah. bringing. <laughs> and I think about it, and um, um, I mean, you, you, sure. they. Oh, it was famous to. Oh, um, my daughter-in-law is sending me over Limerick ham. Do you know it was just? Um, it was just a diaper and. Quite um, magical because I can remember when we lived, when I was a child and we lived in England, we got our turkey sent to us. And that time it was the bronze turkeys. You would, for Christmas, you'd have your turkey sent over. Yeah. And, and ham. Yeah. We got it. Yeah. And uh, that was really special and, and quite a privilege to, to have it sent to you like that. It was marvelous. So, I love that picture behind me before we go. Um, it's in the, in the purple heather. That's correct. Yeah. Fabulous. It's fair. That'd make you want to drink. I, I never <laughs> drank in my life, but if you were, you know, it's just so warm and so atmospheric. Uh, absolutely. Yes. And conducive to come and drink. Come to have a little sip. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maura, you've yeah. been absolutely, it's true for Aidan, you've been absolutely delightful to talk. And is there anything you'd like to say to add to what we've uh, said? Oh, just that I do hope people enjoy the book. You asked me, what do I think? I think it's a happy book. And there's a lot of little snippets, all the little snippets that are in it. And you can take it up at different times. Don't try to do it all together. Just a little bit now and then. And there are great snippets in it and something. It will appeal to many people for different yeah. reasons. It, absolutely. Both historical, artistic and um, culinary. Thank it. you. Maura, delightful. And it was a pleasure. And I hope we meet in person. Definitely. Thank you so much, Mary. You're very welcome. God bless. So Bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.